Hello, welcome to Economic Singularity Conversations, a series of concise conversations with leaders of interesting organizations about the subject of our future with artificial intelligence. My name is Callum Chase. I'm a keynote speaker on the future of artificial intelligence and the author of a series of books on the subject, including Surviving AI and the Economic Singularity. Today, it's my great pleasure to be talking with Juan Moreno Bal, the Managing Director of Fondation Innovation Innovation Bank Inter. One of the activities of the Fondacion is to, is to host the Future Trends Forum twice a year in Madrid. This forum brings together a lot of very interesting people from around the world to discuss the most interesting subjects of the day. I've attended two of the events and found them absolutely fascinating. Juan and I will spend the next 30 minutes exploring some of the most important questions that we're all facing today. Juan, most of our audience today will know something about the history, the structure and the goals of the Foundation, but as a reminder for them and for those who are unfamiliar with it, could you give us a brief introduction to the Foundation and also explain your role there? Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much, Callum, for uh, having me here today with you, and uh, congratulations for the initiative. I'm really honored to be part of this. Um, yes, the Bankita Innovation Foundation uh, was created back in 2003 um, with the mission to promote innovation and entrepreneurship in our societies, uh, mainly in Spain, but also in, in Portugal. And we do this through different programs that have evolved over the years. As you mentioned, uh, one of our core programs is the Future Trends Forum. It's a think tank where um, we try to anticipate some of the innovation trends that we believe are going to have an impact on our society and, and, and on the Spanish uh, businesses. Um, and we do this uh, uh, together with uh, experts uh, like you. We were lucky to have you in two of our editions. Uh, uh, from a multidisciplinary approach, uh, experts from different fields approaching a topic uh, uh, that can be very different uh, from edition to edition. Just to give you uh, some examples or with the audience some examples, we've talked about the commercialization of space. Um, uh, we've talked about uh, artificial intelligence, obviously, and more recently we've talked about uh, neuroscience and, and uh, what promising technologies uh, are going to uh, to uh, uh, provide new opportunities uh, uh, in, the, in, in a horizon of five to 10 years. Um, we also work with companies uh, and obviously with the most innovative ones. So first with startups, we have a, a joint program with Bank Inter uh, Venture Capital, uh, where we invest in, in, in a seed phase in startups uh, of, with a technology base uh, and, and we follow uh, we follow them and we continue and accompany them throughout the years to help them uh, uh, develop uh, their products and, and, and their solutions. Uh, we also work with uh, uh, middle market companies. We created a program called Creciendo, uh, together initially with uh, uh, Ethics and uh, Circulo Empresarios, which are two Spanish private, uh, public and private uh, organizations respectively. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we, what we do is we select uh, um, high potential uh, mid-market companies uh, and we uh, share together with external collaborators best practices uh, um, and also um, and try to anticipate some of the trends that are happening uh, globally. Um, and uh, we do this through different uh, series of workshops. And this program has now evolved into the Creciendo Foundation. It's a separate entity. We continue supporting that entity now, but uh, it has a larger scale and reach, and it's working really, really well uh, with amazing companies being part of the program. Uh, we Currently, uh, there are around 110 companies uh, part of the program. Hmm. Um, and then we also have a, a program uh, for students. Uh, we work with uh, 10 of the best universities in Spain, and we deploy an innovation and entrepreneurship program uh, where we bring experts uh, uh, that are uh, part of our community um, um, to help students understand how to, uh, I mean, innovation in action, how to uh, create innovative products or innovative ways to reach uh, 
customers or to access markets and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and overall, over, over all these years, we've created a community of uh, uh, around 3,000 people uh, around us uh, that are uh, not only students, but uh, experts uh, from different angles, business leaders, uh, entrepreneurs that are all, all have the common denominator of being uh, uh, inno innovators or very interested in innovation. That's really interesting. And that's, that's a lot of innovation. That's a lot of new initiatives that you've started in, in the last few years. So well done. Um, let, let's turn to the current crisis, which is on everybody's minds. How do you think it's going to affect the Fondathion? Are you going to, uh, are you and your people working, obviously you're working remotely now, but do you think you will be working remotely in the, in the medium long term? And what about the meetings that you have? Will they be handled remotely as well? Well, uh, I mean, when all this crisis started, uh, we, I mean, we've worked with different horizons, obviously. So the very immediate action was to get uh, uh, all our, uh, all the team uh, working from home uh, and also uh, move all our activities online to ensure that all our community was, uh, was safe. So that was our, our first and, and foremost priority. Uh, and I have to say that, uh, We've been very, very lucky because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the systems uh, and, and all the resources uh, were ready. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and the transition has been pretty smooth, uh, almost uh, seamless, I would say, uh, in most of our activities. So midterm, we then started uh, planning for some, uh, some uh, activities. We've obviously had to uh, rethink some of the things we were planning to, to launch. Uh, but in, in the things, in the activities that we were, that were already flying, um, uh, well, first of all, we, we, apart from moving everything online, we've refocused all our activities uh, towards the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, all our contents. Uh, we've uh, uh, done, uh, we've launched a series of uh, webinars uh, to bring experts from our community to try to shed some light on different aspects of this crisis. Uh, from uh, Spain, but also uh, uh, from from all over the world. So uh, that's more midterm and, and longer term. Yes, well, I mean, we are obviously revisiting uh, a number of uh, of uh, activities, in particular how we deploy our, our activities. Uh, I think the first thing uh, we've, I mean, if if we think about the long term, uh, the first thing uh, we've noticed is that there's been a a huge acceleration of everything digital, right? In, in all the activities in our community. Um, and obviously remote working is, is the first one. I think uh, to your question, longer term, I think uh, um, longer term, this, will, this crisis will, will make us work differently. I don't think it's gonna be uh, working from home as we are today or working face-to-face -face as we used to do. I think it's going to be a mix, some somewhere in in between. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm an optimist uh, by by nature, and I think it's it's been a great opportunity uh, and an accelerated uh, uh, course for everyone uh, in our community to 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 work online. So I think I think it's gonna some of it will remain, and uh, and and I think we're gonna move uh, a number of activities online. Uh, and this is going to affect, I think, not only on how we work, but also how we meet. So obviously, uh, the, the most immediate uh, feature transform, we're going to do it online. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are no alternatives, right? But I think, that, I mean, we're also uh, revisiting how we evolve some of the activities, even when we have the opportunity to do them face-to-face, -to, -face, to have like a complement, a hybrid of, uh, of both. Um, also, I mean, I think it's going to have a huge impact on how we share. I mean, the webinars have, have been a great success. And uh, I mean, we typically work in, uh, I mean, we, we run conferences and meetings. And I think uh, this has proven that some of the uh, online activities are also very, very useful to reach people, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, how we travel, right? Um, I think we, we are all going to value much more uh, uh, the face-to-face -face meetings, we're going to run less unnecessary meetings. Uh, I, now we see that we used to abuse some of these meetings. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to be much more selective 
uh, on, on how we do that. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be really interesting. In, in your um, Future Trends forums, mm -hmm. Fora, you get 40 or 50 people from around the world in, in a meeting, in a, in a conference room. It's really hard to replicate that online, to have that many people sitting in front of a computer for, you know, for eight hours a day or six hours a day, two days. Um, are you going to try and do that or are you going to make it much shorter? How are you going to handle that side of it? We, I mean, we are uh, um, planning to do a much shorter uh, sessions. We still want to do it uh, across several days. And uh, I mean, the, the, the positive thing is that everyone now is very open and willing to do this meeting online, online mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. And, and, and I, I have to say the reaction of all the experts has been, has been great and, and they're all willing to, to do this meeting online. So, so are you um, finding that you're able to get some guests that you might not otherwise have got? Have you got Barack Obama coming? <laughs> well, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, that is happening. Also, is that it's it's definitely, I think, much easier to to uh, to reach uh, some more prominent uh, experts as well. But uh, I mean, we were we are already very very happy with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 experts that uh, we've been able to bring to the FTF. Uh, no, I, absolutely. I, I I didn't mean to um, cast any aspersions on your your list of guests. I mean, <laughs> even though you've had me a couple of times, you you get a lot of very impressive people. There's no question, including you as well. So, <laughs> so uh, no, absolutely. I mean, I think we're gonna we're gonna uh, make it shorter, which is also a challenge. Uh, I think the core of the discussion is uh, is there, uh, and uh, we've uh, we've planned different ways of reaching online with with uh, with a dedicated tool as well to help navigate all the different sessions uh, throughout uh, the different days. So, I mean, we are excited and, and we believe, uh, um, I mean, definitely it won't have the face-to-face uh, -face touch, but uh, we believe that, uh, that uh, we can meet our objective, which is to identify some of these uh, new opportunities and, and, and try to see also how to address some of the challenges that uh, uh, new trends are, are, are bringing uh, to our society. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I look forward to um, seeing the seeing the recordings and and uh, the guest list for uh, the next the next meetings. I'm sure it'll be really interesting to see how you, how you adapt. I'm sure it'll be very successful. Um, let's think about how this crisis is affecting society and countries uh, more widely. I mean, it seems to me that obviously we can't predict the future, and a lot depends, I think, on the length of time it takes for us to recover from this, the length of time it takes for us all to come out of doors and get used to seeing each other again and, and being safe in public, mm. and the speed with which the economies recover. Um, people talk about V-shaped and U-shaped and L-shaped and W-shaped recoveries. I suspect that if we get a V-shaped recovery, then the world in 2021, late 2021, 22, Mm -hmm. won't look terribly different from the world today. There will be more remote working, probably more automation, but it'll be very recognizable from today's world. If we have a, a U-shaped or God forbid an L-shaped, i.e. with no recovery, um, then the world's going to be very different um, and in, in probably some very unpleasant ways that um, we don't really want to go into too much detail about. Yeah. Um, as you said, there's going to be a lot more digital in our lives. We're going to all have a, a blend of, of remote working and face-to-face and -face working um, because we've all had um, a crash course. I think you said, uh, I think when we were speaking earlier, I think you said uh, an unexpected quiz, an unannounced quiz uh, that we're all going through, having to figure out how Zoom and uh, other, other, other platforms work. Um, so, there will be more of that. It's enabled that, and that should be a good thing. Cut down the amount of travel we all have to do, uh, save a lot of time, be more efficient. And it'll be great if we can choose the, the best of both worlds. The other thing that people expect to happen is, is an increase in automation because, and, and automation of delivery services and cashiers so that humans are taken out of harm's way um, and machines can deliver things from, from person to person. And I think that's, that's right, although I do think the 
um, the, 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 the bottleneck, the thing that governs that, the speed of that is, is the technology rather than the demand for it. Um, Amazon Go is still in its fairly early stages. It's a bit, a bit uh, uh, blinky and, and, and quite expensive, obviously. Um, it's, it's coming, there's no doubt it's coming, and maybe it'll be accelerated, but it can only go as fast as the technologist can perfect it. And, and engineers have this joke that um, in any complicated uh, engineering project, the first 99% of the project takes the first 99% of the time that you allocate to it. And the last 1% of the project takes the next 99% of the time. So it always takes a little bit longer to get there than you think. Um, so we hype something up, we get very excited about it, then it's slow to arrive and we have the backlash against the hype and then suddenly it appears and then we just take it for granted. It's kind of always been there. And I'm sure automation of shops and delivery, um, delivery pots will be like that, uh, but it's governed by the speed of the technology rather than uh, the demand for it. Are there any other sort of long-term effects that you, affect on, on, you expect on, on society at large? Well, I mean, uh, I think that we are already seeing uh, the importance of innovation. Uh, um, I mean, uh, and, and in a number of uh, different areas. And I think that's going to uh, remain uh, in the future. So just to give you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all have examples, but uh, we've seen uh, crescendo companies, for example, pivoting really quickly their production lines to to create products specific to the crisis, uh, uh, to, to for health workers, uh, we've seen also a number of uh, startups that we work with, uh, really anticipating some of the new trends that they expect to have uh, in, in in a few months' time, and starting developing new products and new solutions to 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 uh, to uh, reach those customers. So, agree with you that uh, the technology is going to be key here, and and. And technology innovation is, is going to be a key. And I expect that this is going to continue. I've also uh, noticed that uh, there's a huge appetite for knowledge and for uh, uh, the knowledge of experts, right? Mm -hmm. I think the role of the expert is somehow going to be also uh, uh, more uh, and more important uh, for, um, I mean, for different organizations, I mean, public or private. Uh, so I expect that our role there, uh, which is also to bring some of the knowledge and insights of those experts, will be somehow um, uh, more needed and, 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 and we will be able yeah, to... Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, among other things, one of your most important roles is, is, a, is a convener. You're a convener of experts and I can see that that's going to be increasingly important. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, and the other thing is, uh, I mean, some of these uh, technologies or, uh, that uh, are uh, that we're going to need to use maybe uh, in the short or midterm uh, pose some questions. I mean, what do you think about uh, uh, the uh, data privacy, for example? I mean, we are seeing that currently. Well, first of all, data is is being far from perfect everywhere globally, right? So uh, I think that without the right uh, collection of data, we won't be able to make the right predictions. So I would like to understand what you think about that. Second is, uh, uh, I mean, there's this question about tracing uh, um, and, and, and also predicting. So how, I mean, what do you think about the, uh, I mean, uh, the privacy versus uh, safety uh, compromise, I would say. Um, so, uh, those those two things are are something that well, as 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 you said, I mean this is like a crash course, right? So let's let's see how this evolves. But what what do you think about this the, the data? Uh, yeah, well, you know, clearly there is a, a trade off between privacy and and frankly saving lives. Um, back in, I think it was 2013, uh, Ken Kukie wrote a book called um, Big Data, and in that he noted that. During the Ebola crisis earlier in the, in the century, uh, WHO or some other health organization asked the phone companies for data about the movement of people in the affected regions, saying that they could um, contain, the, contain the disease better if they had that data. And the, the phone company said, sorry, we, we simply can't give it to you. It's illegal. 
uh, data privacy reasons. And um, I guess it's probably never been proved because you can't prove the counterfactual, but people probably died as a result of that. So there's a, a very serious trade-off decision to be made. Clearly, we're going to need to surrender some privacy uh, if we want to have the best possible uh, um, testing and tracing processes. And we have to have the best possible testing and tracing processes because we won't have a, a vaccine for this virus for at least another year, most likely. Um, and so you know, we can put in place some provisions. So we can have sunset clauses for arrangements which allow governments to track our to, to, to gather and, and, and uh, keep our data. Um, and we can have um, strict limits on the way that, that it can be used. But of course, governments, once they've got their hands on some data, they're often very reluctant to let go of it and stop using it. And they don't always tell us the truth about what they are using it for. So um, it, it's, it's risky. Um, there's a very interesting debate going on in the UK at the moment and in other countries in, in Europe. Traditionally, European countries have been much more uh, concerned about privacy, or at least overtly concerned about privacy, and have accused the tech giants of being uh, rather cavalier about it, perhaps even irresponsible. And now we've got a situation where Google and Facebook have developed an app for our smartphones where a smartphone will learn whether its owner has been in the same area as somebody who's subsequently become affected. And the data that reveals that will never be available to any third party. It'll be on the phones and only on the phones. And governments in Europe are saying, well, hang on, we actually want that data because if we have that data, we can uh, add in extra layers of security. We can, for instance, stop people falsely claiming uh, or we can stop the ramifications of people making false claims that they've been infected because they want to uh, alarm a whole lot of other people. And there's various other things that you can do if you have the data held centrally. And so there's this really interesting switcheroo has happened where the European governments uh, are now saying, well, hang on, Google and Facebook are being too um, dictatorial about privacy. But um, I, I think that you know, we are going to have to surrender some privacy. I think that's the bottom line. We're gonna to have to surrender some privacy and hopefully we can make it temporary. Okay. And as I, I remember uh, at the FTF, uh, you shared with us uh, uh, um, your insights on what you think about uh, what uh, you call the economic singularity. Uh, I mean, the process of automation and the impact of, of unemployment, right? Uh, I, I mean, I, I found that uh, um, session really, really terrific. So can you share uh, uh, what you mean by that, and also, uh, has this current crisis changed how you uh, thought this was going to be happening? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for setting up that open goal for me, Juan. Well, as you know, I'm very happy to bore people forever on this subject. Uh, I think it's one of the two most important things that is coming uh, in, in this century, the other being superintelligence. Um, no, the crisis hasn't really changed things on that front, as far as I'm concerned, because I don't see technological unemployment coming uh, for two or three decades. I do think it will come. I do think that we will get to a point where machines are able to do pretty much everything that humans can do for money. Certainly all the, all, almost all the jobs that we do now, but also all the, all, almost all the jobs that we could do in 20 or 30 years. Um, that's highly contentious, obviously. I think probably most people who think about this don't think that. They think that we will always, humans will always do jobs. And, and I call those people pessimists because the idea that humans always have to be wage slaves, I, I think is a shame. I think we could do more interesting things uh, if, we, mm. if we didn't have to worry about money. Um, but between now and the time when the economic singularity happens, when we get tech full, full-blooded technological unemployment, there's going to be another phenomenon, which I call the churn, which is an increasingly rapid turnover of jobs and careers. Um, because mm -hmm. although it's going to be a long time before machines can do everything that we can do for money, they will do more and more of what we currently do for money and what we do for money tomorrow and the day after. And their progress is accelerating. You know, some people say that Moore's law, the 
the, the observation that machines are getting twice as good every 18 months. Some people say that's dead or dying, but it's not true. It's, it's evolving as, as it always has. So the machines are getting better at a, an exponential rate and hence the, the churn of jobs and careers will accelerate. And we need to get much, much better at training. Now, how has, how has this crisis affected that? As I said earlier, um, automation, demand for automation may be sped up by this, particularly if, say, we don't get a virus, in, in a, uh, sorry, a vaccine in a year's time, and the, um, the social distancing and the, uh, the, the testing and tracing has to go on for years, then clearly there's going to be a really strong demand for automation. Uh, and that will spur more and more investment in, in, in the R&D, and it, it will speed up to some extent. So that might collapse that time frame for the churn uh, and get us to the economic singularity sooner. I rather hope not, because we need to figure out how we're going to deal with the economic singularity if it happens. Um, we have to figure out that it is going to happen. We have to, we've got to persuade more and more people that there's a serious possibility that it will happen, then therefore it is worth taking seriously enough to do contingency planning for it. Um, I think there are solutions to it. I think there are ways of coping with it, which could be great. Um, and the one I think I pin my, my hopes on is, is the economy of abundance. And it sounds like a crazy idea when you first hear it, but it's the idea that we have an economy where uh, almost everything you need, in fact, everything you need for a very good standard of living is almost free. I think we can get there because AI will remove humans from the workplace and, and humans are the most expensive component of most products and services. Energy will get cheaper and cheaper because the uh, cost of production of solar cells and batteries is coming down at a, at a rapid rate. And AI will also make all our processes more efficient generally, fewer uh, raw materials going into, into everything and, and more efficient production processes. So I think we can get to the economy of abundance, uh, but to do it, we need a, a consensus that it's a good idea uh, and that it's possible. And B, we need to get everybody happy with the idea that we do try and automate humans out of the workplace. At the moment, that's mm -hmm. a very controversial and, and um, to most people rather unwelcome idea. So I, I wouldn't want to see the time frame between now and the economic singularity collapsed by the virus or anything else, because it's going to take us time to develop a consensus and work out all the, the pieces of the jigsaw that need to get us from here to there, or, or the struts in the ladder that need to get mm -hmm. us from here to there. And, and, and uh, you mentioned training. Uh, do you have any recommendation to, uh, to students? Uh, I mean, what, what, what are the careers or the areas that you would suggest they start focusing their uh, efforts and their careers towards? Yeah, I, as you know, I, I make my living by giving talks, uh, keynotes around the world. And, and that's a question which comes up every single time. Um, everybody in the audience says, uh, I've got a son or a grandson or a nephew uh, who's at university or about to go to university. What should they study? And I do have an answer for it. Um, the answer used to be a few years ago, the consensus answer used to be, well, study computing um, and especially machine learning. Uh, because that's going to be a real growth area for the next few years. And that, that's still true. But then people started thinking, well, um, actually, machines will take over more and more of uh, most jobs, including software development. Uh, machines will write their own software and, and improve their own software. So really what we all ought to be doing is concentrating on the things that the machines cannot do. Uh, and the machines have no consciousness, therefore they have no empathy. Therefore, we should all be studying the humanities and, 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 and cultivating our creativity and our, and our empathetic skills. Um, there's also a problem with that, though, that machines can present a, a, a reasonable uh, semblance of, of creative. Well, actually, they are creative, but they can also present a semblance of empathy. So I'm not sure that's much of a defense. So the answer I do give to people is to say people should study what interests them most because it's only if you study what actually interests you that you mm -hmm. will excel. And you know, if you study English and that's really what you like doing, then you've got a chance of doing something excellently and then you will prosper. 
and the same for maths or computer science. So I don't think it's an idea, a great idea to try to guide your career according to what you think are going to be the skills that the workplace needs in five years. We just don't know. Study okay. what interests you. Study, you know, follow your passion. Okay. So it's a, okay. it's a classic and a, and a great recommendation, I think. I agree with you. Great. So, and, and in terms of this uh, crisis, I mean, what, what do you think are the main lessons learned from the, I mean, uh, our preparation or lack of preparation to this crisis? Uh, yeah. uh, will so, we be um, ready for the next one? Uh, yeah. Say, I mean, I don't know, no one knows who, uh, what's going to be the next one, but say we have a massive uh, cyber attack, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you think we're going we're gonna to learn from this? And what are the things that you should, do you think we should learn to try to be better prepared for next time? I think that governments um, who haven't done very well will try to move the goalposts and muddy the field so that we can't tell how well or badly they did. And I don't think they will succeed because there's some fairly simple measures like um, the number of excess deaths in each country. So you're, com you're not comparing uh, one country which has got a very dense population who, and quite wealthy with another population which has got a very sp scarce, uh, sparse population and is poor. You're comparing each country with itself. And some countries will have a massive step up in the, in the number of deaths and other countries will have only a very small one. So I think there will be metrics to see how well different, com different governments have performed. <clears throat> and um, so I think we will learn lessons from that, I hope so. And clearly we have to learn the obvious lessons, which we should have learned before. Um, you know, this wasn't a black swan event. We knew something like this was not necessary, but probably going to happen sooner or later. Famously, Bill, Gate Bill Gates gave a TED talk about it five years ago. The UK government actually ran an exercise called Project Cygnus, uh, which is sort of a dry run for it, and then forgot to order the gowns and the, and the other PPE, which is a tragedy. So we need to uh, build up stockpiles of emergency equipment for the next uh, case like this, because there probably will be another pandemic, and, and it could be worse. It could have a, wor a higher R value, uh, contaminate more people. It could, contil could kill more of the people that it, that it infects. But there's also other crises that, that we know are quite likely. Um, you know, a, a, an asteroid coming uh, and hitting the planet. We, we really ought to figure out how to um, perhaps send Elon Musk up there and have him shoot a rocket away to, to make it go away. You know, we need to deal with the other crises that we can see. And I think in general, this has been a, a really big wake up call to the fact that we are vulnerable. Our societies are vulnerable. And we need to figure out what um, potential crises are coming. And of course, personally, I think that the economic singularity is the biggest crisis that we're likely to face in the next 30 to 20 to 20 to 40 years. And we really ought to ought to uh, prepare for that one. Okay. So Juan, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for joining. And uh, do you have any parting comments? Uh, well, um... Yes, uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, to me, it's uh, uh, something I forgot to, to, to say is that it's been really interesting uh, to see uh, how people are, have reacted to this situation and uh, how technology has helped us uh, deal with it. And, and I'm thinking, uh, I heard somewhere recently that uh, we're talking about social distancing, but thanks to technologies, and, and people, uh, elderly people, young people, everyone talking on applications like, uh, like this one, like Zoom or any other video conferencing, uh, we haven't really distanced so much. So this, this has not been social distancing, but rather physical uh, uh, distancing, right? Mm. So I think that, I mean, uh, within all these, uh, uh, I mean, difficulties uh, and, and, and very hard uh, situation, I think we are somehow lucky that we have technology and that uh, people have really uh, uh, made a great job in, in adopting those technologies to help us uh, remain closer, right? Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very good point and a nice optimistic note to end on. We've, we've all probably been talking to people uh, that we haven't spoken to for ages and, that, and that's a really exactly. good thing. So let's hope that 
uh, as well as all the terrible things this, this virus is going to do. It, it helps bring us together in some important ways. Yeah. Juan, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Thank you, Callum, very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks a lot. You too. Bye-bye.